All right, well, I didn't have my touchscreen laptop with me, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, record um, part of Chapter 11 for Friday's assignment here. <clears throat> you can still watch this on YouTube. However, I have narrowed down the information, so I'm going to go ahead and re-record this for you. So uh, we're going to be starting with 11.4, the spinal cord. So this is Chapter 11. All right. So the spinal cord is a column of nervous tissue. It's continuous with the brain. So that means it, it's it's attached. You can uh, see here. Where's my little light? Oh, well, it doesn't seem to want to work. OK, sorry about that. You can see here that it is attached. All right. Now you can see you see it's attached here to the brain. All right. Um, <clears throat> and it's going to, of course, extend on down here through the vertebral canal. The gray matter of the spinal cord is main, uh, made mostly of inner neurons, all right, and is divided into what we call horns, okay? Um, it begins at the foramen magnum, which is, the, remember, that large hole in the, in the base of the skull, and it's going to end or terminate at the first and second lumbar vertebrae, okay? Uh, and then it's going to dangle on down here um, <clears throat> as those... Um, free nerves that caught at equina okay all right so this is a cross section of the spinal cord uh, let's turn this highlighter back on you can see here this is the anterior horn okay and then this is the posterior horn here all right so in the brain the gray matter surrounds the white matter in the spinal cord the white matter surrounds the gray matter OK, <clears throat> we also have uh, the let's see the dorsal root here. The dorsal root ganglion is the one here um, or well, this is the root. And then this section right here, this is the ganglion. OK, uh, we looked at the anterior horn um, dorsal root. OK, I guess that's all we really kind of need to look at here. So we're going to talk a little bit about reflexes, okay? And these are based on what we call a reflex arc. Uh, communication in the nervous system is going to combine those action potentials that go along the axon um, and synaptic transmission between the neuron and the postsynaptic postsynaptic cell, okay? So two or more neurons involved in this communication are what we call a nerve pathway. Simple nerve pathways start with a sensory receptor, okay, and end with what we call an effector and can have or must have at least two neurons, but they can function on only two neurons. And the two neurons, sometimes they are uh, going to be way more complex than that, okay? But this simple type of pathway is what we call a reflex, okay? So reflexes, you know, kind of, we think of them as happen, happening automatically okay um, and so these can sometimes um, only go to the spinal cord to be completed they don't have to always go all the way to the brain okay so these are automatic subconscious responses to stimuli in or outside of the body most of these are going to be sensory to motor okay uh, that's going to be your your simple reflex sorry not most of them but your simple reflex is just a sensory neuron to a note to the be interpreted and then back through the motor neuron. Uh, most common reflexes are going to be sensory, then association, then motor neuron. Okay, so all reflexes have a reflex arc, and this is the very basic fundamental reflex arc arc you're going to have a receptor and that's going to be your sensory um, receptor okay and it's going to travel along afferent neuron remember afferent comes into so it's going to go into the central nervous system okay and then it's going to leave via a motor neuron which is going to be efferent so efferent think exit all right and that is going to go on to the effector and remember a, an effector is going to be a muscle or gland and that's going to cause the effect that the brain wants so if you have the reflex where the doctor comes in takes the little hammer i don't even know if they do this anymore uh but they take the little hammer and they hit your knee and your knee jerks it's the knee jerk knee jerk reflex okay and we're going to look at that briefly um and so the receptor you're going to sense that hammer hitting that nerve right there is going to send information to the spinal cord via the sensory afferent neuron uh, that spinal cord is going to send back information to tell the motor or efferent or to tell the effector cell the muscle to kick out and it's going to travel via the motor or efferent neuron OK, so the, it's processed just at a basic sensory nervous cent, central nervous system level. OK, so um, these fibers are going to carry them in and out. All right. 
you definitely need to know the parts of this and you need to know the order in which they go. If it's sensory, if it's afferent, okay, motor is going to be afferent, all right? <clears throat> and know what the effectors are. Effectors are always going to be muscles or glands. So this is a good little chart here to study. Be sure you know this. It gives you all those parts, tells you what the description and what the function is. So be sure you know this chart. All right, here's an illustration of that reflex art arc sorry okay um and so you can see where it's coming in here all right so a sensory neuron okay so here's your receptor this is in your skin so you sense something so um perhaps you're cold okay so it's going to sense cold it's going to travel along this sensory neuron remember that's afferent a a comes first you're going to receive the information first all right um, and then it's going to have some integration, okay? Integration means uh, it's going to go to the uh, central nervous system, and you're going to have at least one synapse. And in this case, we have an interneuron, okay? And it's this little pink or purplish color here. So that's an in-between. So this is the sensory neuron here. This is the motor neuron. And actually what I should do is, oh, and I can't remember the color. Sometimes I color code these with red or blue. Um, I want to say it's red and then blue, but I'm not sure, so I don't want to color that. Okay, so sensory going in. An interneuron can be used. It's not always used. It's the go-between. And then uh, motor or efferent exit is going to cause the effect. It's going to go to the muscle or gland, the effector. Okay, and tell that muscle, hey, we're cold. We need to shiver. Okay, and so this is an example of a uh, reflex with an integration center uh, system here at the spinal cord level. All right, so here is that knee jerk reflex. This is also called the patellar reflex. This is our example for a simple reflex. This only has two neurons. And so if you only have two, you gotta have sensory and then you gotta have motor. So sensory to receive the information, motor to carry out the action, all right? So if you hit the patellar ligament just below the patella, which is remember the kneecap, that's gonna start your reflex. The quadriceps muscles are gonna be pulled, um, which triggers stretch receptors. You have receptor, stretch receptors in those muscles that'll sense that pulling, and that is gonna send impulses to a sensory neuron, okay? And that's usually gonna be unipolar. Um, and the lumbar regions of your spinal cord is where that's located. Um, the axon is gonna synapse with a motor neuron uh, causing the leg to contract and extend when the reflex is completed, okay? This is also used to help us maintain our upright posture. So if you're standing and the knee bends in response to gravity, okay, or perhaps somebody comes, well, I'm getting ahead, um, the quads are going to stretch and trigger the reflex, which is going to straighten the leg up so you don't fall down, all right? Uh, let's see if this animation here works. Maybe not. Okay. Um, I'll put a link for that if there's not already. So we also have a withdrawal reflex. Okay. And so this is like if you were to step on a tack in this illustration or touch a hot stove. Okay. So this happens when you encounter something painful. All right. Uh, it involves a sensory neuron and then there's an interneuron this time and a motor neuron. OK, so if you step on a tack, your skin receptors are going to be activated. They're going to sense that as pain and send impulses to the spinal cord through. Um, let's see, I think this was moving with my actually. OK, so you're going to step on the tack and this is sensory. So this is going to be afferent. All right. And it's going to go on into the spinal cord here. Um, <clears throat> synapse with the interneuron the and this is going to be processed here at the spinal cord level that is going to uh send information down through your motor neuron here and tell it to uh contract and withdraw that leg okay or withdraw that foot anyway all right so uh, these contract pulling the foot away Okay, so we can also have a crossed extensor reflex. So if you pull your foot up from the tack, okay, so you picked one foot up off the ground, um, your muscles in your other leg have to contract to support your weight. So you can also have a crossed extensor reflex. So when the flexor muscles on the affected side contract, that's the ipsilateral 
uh, side there. The flexors uh, muscles on the limb on the other side, which would be contralateral, are going to be inhibited. Okay, the extensor is going to contract and help support the body weight. So this is going to be a crossed extensor reflex. So as you pull one up and relax some, you're going to contract the other. So again, you don't fall down. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So here you've got your sensory neuron, okay? Oh, there we go. Here's your sensory neuron. Uh, it's going to come up through the dorsal root there. Uh, you're going to synapse. It looks like with you're going to synapse here with several interneurons, okay? And so you can see one is going to, well, let's go to this one. This one is going to this muscle um, to pull the leg up to contract the flexor, which pulls it up and relax these, okay? And then this is going to tell this one um, here, your extensor to contract and the flexor to relax, because remember those are an opposing motion. So that way your leg is uh, contracted enough that it supports your weight. So that's really important. And so it's kind of a complex task, seems very easy. You pick one, up, one leg up and you stand on the other, but your body has to be able to coordinate that um, where it occurs at the same time and it does occur automatically which is really helpful all right <clears throat> let's see so basically interneuron pathways in the spinal cord um, these are going to have sensory impulses that come on one side of the cord to go to the other side if you notice we're going to both sides there uh, and produce the opposite effect okay and that's going to be really important for things that we have like arms and legs on both sides Okay, so we used to get in a lot more detail on this, but we're not going to get real detailed, okay? Just a little basics here. So we have tracks in the brain um, of the spinal cord and the spinal nerves that can allow two-way communication. It's just basically a pathway, okay? And so these conduct, uh, spinal tracks can conduct sensory impulses to the brain, and these are going to be ascending going up, kind of common sense there. All right, <clears throat> and then those that conduct the motor impulses that are coming out are descending. They're coming down from the brain and going to the muscles or the glands, okay? And so these are just going to be pathways, um, and then they can branch off from there, okay? This is important for understanding things like referred pain, okay? All right, so this brings us to the brain, which is what you're going to be working on in the lab this afternoon. So I hope that you watch this before lab, okay? <clears throat> so the brain has um, association areas. When well, I think we'll get far enough for it to be helpful in lab, we shall see. Um, the brain's got association areas that has different functions, sensations, and perceptions, okay? Um, it's going to send commands to skeletal muscles. It's going to perform higher mental functions like memory and reason. It's going to coordinate those muscle movements. Um, it regulates your visceral activities like digestion, sees the, uh, <clears throat> oversees the function of the entire body, okay? And it also gives us, and we don't quite understand all of this yet, but it gives us the characteristics that help to form our personality. All right, <clears throat> so we talked about some of these different functions of the brain, memory, reasoning, decision-making, coordinating, uh, and regulating personality. All right, so there are different major parts of the brain, okay? This is what you need to be practicing in lab. You have the cerebrum, all right, and that is going to be divided into lobes, and it can also be divided into hemispheres. We're going to have the frontal lobe, and you definitely need to know all these lobes. Frontal, okay, parietal, occipital temporal and one that is most commonly missed is the insula okay insula you think island inside and that's what this green portion is here you can see this um, on um, the brain that co collapses and comes apart so look for this in a lab and it's basically the brain stem and it's going to have a lobe like this and a lobe like this and then kind of come down like this that's a, probably a bad drawing. It's a little more rounded right here, okay? And so this portion here will be the insula. So be sure that you practice and learn that because that's one of the most, it's the only lobe that people usually miss, okay? Because you just don't see it that often, all right? Um, <clears throat> insula means island, so it's deep within the brain, all right? And you can only see it, like I said, on that collapsible model that breaks apart into several pieces. So be sure you practice with that. Um, then on the bottom there, we have the diencephalon. Um, here, let's see. Here we have the diencephalon, okay? Then you have the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. This is the cerebellum, that's the tiny brain I was talking about. 
Uh, and then this is the brain stem, which is made of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. Okay, so be sure you practice all of these parts. Now, I remember when I was in anatomy and we were learning about the mesencephalon and diencephalon and all this stuff here on how your brain, this is how your brain actually develops from a fetus from like day one, um, which parts of the brain of what we call this primitive neural tube become other parts of the brain. And I remember thinking, well, why in the heck do we need to know this? Okay, this is really important because this is where we see a lot of things occur that can cause problems later on neural tube defects. Okay, like spina bifida and where they occur and when they occur during development. <clears throat> so understanding this is really important to that. Okay, so brain structures, the basic structures of your brain reflect the way it formed during this embryonic development. Okay, and we're talking about through the womb, development throughout um, from a fetus before it's born. Okay, so this begins as this basic neural tube here, and then that's going to give rise to or change later on. It's a weird thing to say, give rise to, but that's the way they always say it. It's going to become the central nervous system later on. OK, um, and so it begins as this neural tube that gives rise to the central nervous system. The portion that contains the brain is going to have these three major cavities. You have the forebrain here. OK, that's in the forefront. That's the prosencephalon. Then you have the midbrain, and this is the mesencephalon, and then the hindbrain, which is the rhombencephalon. OK, <clears throat> and then this is going to divide later on um, to become other portions here. All right. And so later it's going to divide into anterior and posterior portions and the hind brain. And so instead of having three, it's going to have five cavities. OK, and so <clears throat> you're going to have five cavities develop from these three. You're going to have the tail encephalon and then the diencephalon. OK, mesencephalon and then metaencephalon. Um, and so here, this is going to become the cerebral hemisphere, as you can see over here, okay? Diencephalon stays as the diencephalon. The mesencephalon becomes the midbrain over here, okay? <clears throat> Metaencephalon is what's going to become the pons and the cerebellum. Medulla, I'm sorry, uh, my... <laughs> Myla encephalon is going to become the medulla oblongata, and the neural tube will later become the spinal cord. So things that don't occur right in this process, if we're going from here to here, can cause birth defects that have very significant results. So we're going to look at three disorder or three uh, neural tube defects here that can occur along this developmental processes process. Um, so first is anencephaly, and this is when a fetus or newborn um, is born with a, I should say newborn, is born with a face and a lower brain, but the stru uh, structures, lower brain structures, but doesn't have the higher brain structure. Um, and so uh, this child will normally only survive a day or two. Um, anencephaly is a type of neural tube defect that occurs about the 28th um, <clears throat> day of, of prenatal development. And so a sheet of tissue that normally folds to form that neural tube uh, when it's going to be changing um, develops into the uh, central, later, sorry, later on develops to the central nervous system that's going to stay open at the top. Okay. Um, and so that's, of course, like we said, pretty much incompatible with life. In spina bifida, um, <clears throat> this opening is going to occur further down the neural tube, and that can cause paralysis, okay, from that point forward or below. So anywhere below that, the infant would be paralyzed. In some cases, we're actually able to go in, uh, do surgery before birth, during while the child is still in the womb, and close that and so partially correct spina bifida. This can be prevented by taking folic acid. So this is why um, <clears throat> it's important if you are wanting to become pregnant or are pregnant, um, folic acid is really important to take. Okay. And these occur very, very early on, often before many women even know they're pregnant. So that's why somebody that is um, thinking about trying to get pregnant should go ahead and take those folic acid supplements. Because if your folic acid is limited, that's going to increase the chance that the uh, child could have spina bifida. Okay. Another disorder <clears throat> that is uh, per gives you a brain that is smooth, there's no gyri or sulci, okay? and it's called lysencephaly. These convolutions or these foldings increase surface area, so they increase the amount of brain basically that you have. 
give us a smooth looking cerebral cortex. What happens is there's a protein early again in prenatal development that is lacking. Um, and so this prevents certain neurons in the brain from, from migrating or moving to where they're supposed to, which cause the formation of those convolutions. And so the child then is going to be, if you have less brain material, of course, you're, you're going to have uh, intellectual disabilities. And so this is going to cause a very profound um, intellectual disability, okay, uh, with very frequent seizures and many, many other neurological pro subsequent problems, all right? And so we're going to look at some pictures of these. So these two pictures here at left is, is going to be anencephaly, okay? Um, <clears throat> then we have spina bifida at the top right, and then this is lysencephaly, that smooth appearing brain here at the bottom right. All right, so here are some structures here of the uh, brain here. The cerebrum is that largest portion of the mature brain. You've got your two halves or cerebral hemispheres that mirror each other. They're separated by the false cerebri. Remember, that's a sickle-shaped structure. Um, <clears throat> you've got a broad, flat bundle of axons, and that is, forms what we call the corpus callosum, which looks kind of like a C sitting on the be sure and find that okay um, and that's going to be what actually connects the two cerebral hemispheres and allows two-way two-way communication <clears throat> and so we have gyri and sulci these are these uh, ridges or convolutions all right and so the way I keep those straight is sulci sink in so that's what goes down and where it's raised up that's the gyri okay so sulci sink down or it's a shallow groove. A shallow groove is a sulcus. A very deep groove, and on the other hand, is a fissure. And we will look at some of these fissures as well, like the longitudinal fissure. Okay, the uh, this is the lateral sulcus. All right, you need to know these landmarks. Okay, so that longitudinal fissure here is going to separate the left and right hemisphere. Okay. <clears throat> You also have the central sulci here that's going to separate your frontal lobe and your parietal lobe, okay? Um, so those are landmarks. Uh, the colors here in the picture do distinguish the uh, different lobes of the hemisphere. So on your labeling sheet, you need to color those. So frontal, parietal, occipital, um, and then uh, temporal, okay? And remember, don't forget about insula, all right? The one that is deep insula. All right, here's a good illustration of these lobes, and this one is pulled apart where you can see that insula, okay? Be sure and practice these today. So on the brain here, we have what we call um, <clears throat> functional regions, okay? And that basically tells us what the functions are of that particular portion of the cerebral cortex. We can use things like uh, PET scans um, to image this during um, learning and all, so that way we're able to track what happens in which area, okay? Um, and then we can also study things retrospectively, like people who have suffered from brain injury or disease and see which which function it occurs, okay? Um, I mean, effects, sorry. Um, they sometimes also stimulate the brain mechanically or electrically and see what happens um, to the, and help, that helps them identify the sensory or motor areas, okay? So um, the cerebral cortex is about two to five milliliters of gray matter and has a thin layer that forms the outermost portion of the cerebrum. Um, understanding which areas of the brain have which functions is important. Uh, like we said, to if you see what has happened, if somebody's had a stroke, you can tell which area of the brain is affected by which motor or sensory functions are limited. Uh, we have different areas for speech, Wernicke's area. Um, <clears throat> we'll look at some of these, Broca's area. We'll look at some of these different areas, okay? Okay, so <clears throat> these sensory areas will interpret impulses from your sensory receptors, and that's going to then produce a feeling or a sensation, like feeling temperature, touch, pressure, or pain, okay? These all are going to uh, come to the post-central gyri area, okay? Post-central gyri, gyrus, that's just singular and plural. It's the only difference between gyri and gyrus, okay? Um, <clears throat> the posterior occipital lobe area is going to be responsible for interpreting vision. Um, superior posterior portions of the temporal lobe, of course, that's related to hearing, all right? Uh, taste is going to be at the base of the central sulci. 
um, the centers in the right hemisphere interpret impulses, remember, from the left and vice versa. So there is a crossing over. Uh, vision and hearing do come from both eyes and both ears. Okay, you're going to be able to put those together. And then smell is going to be um, dealt with deep in the cerebrum. Okay, so you have a sensory speech area and a motor speech area. Okay, so Wernicke's area here. Um, Wernicke's area here is going to be the sensory area. So this is where you're going to be able to understand and formulate language. Okay. And then Broca's area is where you're going, is the motor area. And that's where you're going to actually produce speech. So this is going to be shown if you had a stroke and say this area versus this area, you're going to have different symptoms. If you're able to say words clearly, but the wrong word comes forward, like you're trying to say, I want a banana, and you say, I want a frog, then likely Wernicke's area was uh, <clears throat> injured, okay, where the problem is. If your speech is slurred and you're not able to physically produce the words, then Broca's area is the injured area, okay? So these are important. Okay, uh, so then we have the auditory area. And of course, that is hearing, and that's going to be in the temporal lobe, and you're going to interpret what you hear, okay? Uh, area, the area for taste is going to be there near the central sulci. Smell is going to be deeper in the cerebrum, okay? So association areas are usually not just sensory or just motor. They do work together with other parts of the brain. These areas are going to analyze and interpret sensory experiences, provide memory, reasoning, uh, judgment, and emotions, verbalization, okay? <clears throat> All of these things are going to be related to certain sensory areas. All right, so here's some more association areas. The frontal lobe is associated with what we call executive, executive functioning, a higher level thinking task, concentrating, complex problem solving. Uh, it helps to control emotional behavior and awareness of consequences of behaviors. So someone that has uh, damage to the frontal lobe um, may not control their temper very well, that type of thing. The parietal lobe um, <clears throat> is where we're going to interpret sensory information, helping to understand speech and choose appropriate words, okay, like banana instead of frog. Uh, awareness of, of one's own body parts is also here, okay, that proprioception um, and understanding what you, you are seeing, um, forming different um, thoughts of awareness of what a different object is. If I see an apple, I know it's an apple. If I see a face, I know it's a face. Uh, the temporal lobe is going to interpret more complex experiences, um, help you to understand speech, reading, store visual memory, store patterns, okay? Your occipital lobe, um, <clears throat> This is where you're going to have your visual centers, okay, and that's going to help you to analyze certain visual patterns and combine that with senses, okay? So when you recognize a person, you're using this area. You have to see the face, remember the face, and recognize that as belonging to a particular person. Okay, so then we have motor, sensory areas is going to be the more the receiving and motor areas are going to be more the action where we're going to cause something to happen, okay? These are in the pre-central gyri of the frontal lobe, okay, um, <clears throat> and help to do things like control voluntary muscles. Um, Broca's area is also that motor, called the motor speech area. So again, that's where we form language, physically say the word. It's going to be in the frontal lobe. Generally, the left hemisphere is going to be more dominant. Um, and, and it's anterior to the primary motor cortex. Um, and this, again, it controls the muscles involved in speech. So your mouth, your tongue, your larynx. Um, Wernicke's area is where you decide what to say. Broca's area is how you actually speak and say that, okay? Um, so again, if you have an injury to Broca's area, you can understand what somebody is saying, but you can't necessarily respond out loud. Um, the frontal eye field is going to be the motor speech area and uh, control your voluntary eye movements. Okay, we have voluntary and involuntary eye movements. Um, if the area of your cerebral hemisphere corresponding to broke is, oh, we already said that, sorry, um, already went there. Okay, so yeah, we're finished with this. All right, this is a good summary slide here of uh, some of the functions here of the different um, lobes here, okay.